Good evening, everyone. Yes, behind the mask is Mr. Campbell, and uh, there's one thing I know about is about food. So anyways, tonight here, I'm going to uh, welcome two guests here, Natasha Boffo and Sean Heather. So Natasha, so Sean, uh, Sean here has uh, many different uh, uh, restaurants and, and uh, food delicacy things here, and we're gonna be working on a charcuterie board. Now, Mr. Eng at House of Knives donated uh, these charcuterie boards here. Uh, we're going to fill them up with some great holiday uh, fare, and we're going to, and I'm going to be helping him tonight. So we're all in trouble. Yeah. Anyways, we're wearing masks tonight because we're supposed to be uh, uh, socially distant. So when we take the masks off, I'm going to go off camera here and be pre get prepared. So representing the alumni board, Natasha. Okay, she's uh, a 1996 grad, and so in addition to uh, being a grad from STA, she's uh, what we would call a serial entrepreneur. She has an interior design business for many years, and is now a Pilates, uh, Pilates company called Pilates by Natasha. And being a serial entrepreneur, she's also behind Cheerios, Count Chocula, and Shreddies. So she knows a little bit about food. Sean knows a lot about food. As you can tell, we're both built the same way. And uh, so we're living proof that this is gonna be good tonight. So enjoy the evening and welcome to the charcuterie board presentation. For everyone turning in tonight, tuning in tonight, you'll be entered into a draw for a chance to win one of two STA cutting boards. Okay, which are provided by the House of Knives. Yeah, actually, Havana, could you hold that for me there, please? Okay, but to participate, you need to know the answer to this question. What is the history of charcuterie boards? You'll hear the answer from Chef Sean during the webinar. Watch for, if you, if you know the answer, email your answer at the end of the webinar, and you'll be entered into the draw. And so we're looking forward to uh, passing that on to each and every one of you. Thank you, John. So the real reason why we're here this evening is because of this wonderful, fine, generous gentleman beside me who has donated his time to share with us this evening. Sean Heather is the proud father to five children and three dogs. He and his wife, Erin, live in West Vancouver, born in Toronto and raised in Ireland. From age five, Sean spent his summers with family, in London, England. After a globe-trotting stint with Ryan Eyre, he returned home, this time to Canada's west coast. Many years later, Sean is the proprietor and chef of the Heather Hospitality Group. There are four restaurants in this group of companies, including Salt, Irish Heather, Open Outcry, and Shabine, a whiskey bar. In his spare time, when he's not walking his dogs, and driving his children to sports and activities, Sean has been known to sing a song or two in his restaurants. Thank you, Sean. I hope I can live up to the billing. <laughs> Thanks for that warm welcome. It's not great to be here. I'm always delighted to have an opportunity to uh, expand people's knowledge on cheese and cured meats, especially young people. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. When I was 19, I was living in London. I was working in a French restaurant called Maxime's. Maxime de Paris. It was sister restaurant to the famous restaurant in Paris, Maxime's. Maxime's has been around since 1880. Edith Piaf used to sing there. Toulouse the Trek would draw the patrons for beer money. Uh, the Allied officers drank there during the First World War. The German officers drank there during the Second World War. And it's been a powerhouse ever since. It's still in, in business. Uh, so I got a job in London. I was the only guy on the floor that wasn't French. I was completely out of my league, um, but I had a training position. And within a week, the maitre d', who hadn't hired me, realized that I didn't know what I was doing. And I also didn't speak French, and uh, it was a bit of a disaster. So he called me over to the cheese trolley, and he said, uh, Monsieur Hever, explain the cheese. And of course, I had the clue. So he said to me, tomorrow, when you come in, you'll know all 20 cheese, and you'll know the where they're from, and the characteristics of them, or you won't work here anymore. So, I spent all night studying, and some of the guys helped me out, and I went in the next day, and I aced it, 
and I became his go-to guy for the cheese trolley for the next six months. And that's when I fell in love with cheese. And I tell the story because a lot of people don't like cheese, or they don't, they don't like the stink, the blue, the slime on the outside. There's a lot of things not to like about cheese. But sometimes you're forced into a position to eat cheese. You're at a dinner party and you don't offend the host or hostess, or you're on a date and you don't appear to be squeamish or whatever. And then you have cheese and you have that moment where you realize this is pretty awesome. And it takes a moment like that, like I had, to fall in love with cheese. But once you fall in love with cheese, you don't fall in love with cheese. So, I opened a restaurant called Salt, and it's in Gastown, and it's about 12 years ago, and it was opened up to basically future further my love of cheese, cured meat, condiments, and wine. Um, we were lucky, we had been to London or, and, and New York, and we had seen that charcuterie was coming back in. And usually whatever happens in London, New York, within about a year, it hits Vancouver. So we came back straight away, tried to open up a charcuterie restaurant, Salt. We got it, we got it done in about four months. So we were way ahead of the curve and it caught the imagination. We were lucky. It won uh, second best new restaurant in, in Canada with Honor Magazine. And it also won the Cadillac Fairview uh, Arc Award for $50,000 for a concept. So, and it, it pushed us out and we've been going strong ever since it's 12 years now. Even in COVID, we're surviving. So, what I'm gonna do today is talk about a cheese board, uh, a charcuterie board, a cheese, cured meat, and condiments. The kind of things that we serve at Salt, the kind of things that we've curated. And we often would do something like this as part of a, a large party rather than a small group. But these are the same condiments and same cheese that we use on an everyday basis there. Um, charcuterie is actually a French word and it means cooked meat. And for centuries, it was a butcher shop that served cooked meat as opposed to raw meat in Paris and, and Lyon. Um, in the last 20 years, charcuterie has come to mean cheese, crackers, um, as well as cooked meats, cured meats. So there's a history there. It's not, strictly speaking, just about cheese or just about meat anymore. It's about a variety of things. So to start off with our board, I'd like to start with the cheese. So we're going to start tonight with cheese. And where do you start? There are so many types, so many styles. Stinky, smelly, slimy, and those are the, uh, the good points. Um, cheese is loved or hate, hated by people. Um, there are basically three types of cheese. There's cheese made with sheep's milk, and cheese made with goat's milk, and cheese made with cow's milk. Incidentally, has anyone here ever milked a cow? It's funny you ask, Sean. Yes, I have. And uh, my mother used to make some cheese at home. Uh, it's probably not going to taste as good as this, though. You never know. Did she make butter as well? She did. Yeah, she did. Yes. Well, that's great. So many people have stories of cheese, and so many people uh, have grandparents that used to milk cows or make butter, and so it's not a million miles away, but we just, uh, through supermarkets and whatnot, we've sort of stepped away from that basics, but it's in us, and there's a love for cheese when we start to scratch the surface, just like, like that. When you're choosing the cheese to go on a board, it's a balancing act. You need to take into consideration the people that are coming to your house that are going to eat the cheese. Are they lactose intolerant? Do they have a problem with gluten? Um, are they vegetarian? Uh, that's going to dictate in some way what the cheeses are you want to pick. Also, you want to give some cheese that's going to be inexpensive to balance out the fact you're going to buy cheese that's expensive. So you don't want to buy all expensive cheese and you don't want all inexpensive cheese. So you're going to try and balance that out. One cheese that you're going to be able to give a lot of and one cheese that you're going to give a rare amount. And then you also want to try to put something challenging in there, something that's People that want to can try to eat something that they haven't had before. So today, the cheese that we're looking at here is goat's cheese, made with goat's milk. And a lot of people have an issue with goat's cheese. They find it chalky, they find it um, alkaline, not terribly attractive. That's why you'll find people putting caramelized onions with it, or they put jam with it or something to try and take some of that chalky. This is a local goat's cheese from Salmon Arm. And to take away from that element, we have taken the cheese and put uh, caramelized garlic 
and honey and roll them into balls. So it gives that element of homemade, it's simple to do, just caramelize the garlic, let it cool and roll it in. Uh, and so you can do that and people think, look, you've done something, you didn't just buy it another store, right? So that's the first component. We had Gianna De Laurentia, the Food Network star, in Salt to film a section of her show for the Food Network. And she asked me to put together a slate of cheese for her. And I did, and I put this exact goat cheese on the slate. And she tasted it and said it was wonderful. And then she said, well, we're not going to do that on the TV show. Because she said that America isn't ready for goat cheese. And so it's kind of interesting to see that you know, I would have thought the people that followed her would have been all over it, but she knows her audience and she did not want to do that. So it is kind of polarizing. People want to love it, but they also, you know, restaurants don't always put it on because they feel that not everyone likes it. The uh, next cheese that we have here is uh, Camonzola. So this is the German cheese. The Germans bought the right to make Camembert from the French and Gorgonzola from the Italians. And they put the two together, and you end up with a camembert-like cheese with a gorgonzola blue vein through it. This is the kind of cheese that, a blue cheese, that I call a starter blue cheese. It's the kind of cheese that I would recommend if you want to try blue cheese and you're not, you know, very adventurous. This is a cheese that uh, you can start with. It's mild, it's buttery, it's got all of the fat of a brie, but it's also got a little mild blue through it. And it's not expensive, and it's a good way to start. The next cheese that we have is a brie. This one is cow's milk. This also is cow's milk. This brie is from Quebec. We have a wonderful tradition in Quebec. We're fortunate. The Americans don't have that. We do because of the heritage of the French and the monks that came over, and they brought a lot of their cheesemaking skills with them. So you're kind of getting the best of France, but it's in Canada. And this is a wonderful French brie. Uh, one of the things I want to say is about room temperature when you're putting cheese out. This, as you can see, is sort of getting at room temperature and starting to get soft and unctuous, which is, uh, you don't always get to use that word, unctuous. It's unct Does that mean soft? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so um, it's just an all-around pleaser, this cheese. It goes well with sharp tasting things, pickles, it goes well with Honey goes well with fig jam and so on and so forth. So we're fortunate that we have this kind of culture here in Canada, and this is uh, a Quebec brie. The other cheese that we have here is a sheep's milk pecorino from Italy. And this is salty, crumbly. Uh, it uh, sort of a, competes with Parmesan. You can grate it on pastas, slice it thin in sandwiches, or you can just crumble it into your board here. Uh, and it's, uh, it's delicious, it's a crowd pleaser. And this one here is called Comte. So the French, it's French cheese, cow's milk. It, uh, the French basically got tired of buying cheddar from the English. A couple of the wars that they had with them too made it difficult to buy the cheese. So they decided they'd make it themselves. This is from the Jura mountain region, which is up near the Swiss border. So it's got a lot in common with a lot of the Swiss, denser Swiss cheeses. It's nutty, it's sweet, and it's made with the milk of Jersey cows. It's kind of like champagne in that it's made in one region by one set of families and nobody else can make it. And it's aged in ammunition caves from the Maginot line. So it's got a lot of history, a lot of tradition with it. Um, that's our hard cheese. This is our second hard cheese. These are two soft cheese and our even softer cheese. What we've done here is we've got a representation. We've got Italy, France, Germany, Quebec, and BC. So that's nice because you can do a little trip around the board with people. You've also got soft, you've got a small little bit of challenge here with the blue. You've got a hard, a cheddar like, but not a cheddar, so people are interested in that. And you've got Parmesan, but not Parmesan. So you're offering people alternatives, and there's stories to all of it, things that they can learn, they can talk to, talk to you about. And a lot of this is about learning the story, the story that goes with cheese and meat and where they come from. It sort of adds to the enjoyment of it. Say, hey, Sean, can I add another story to your stories? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, you, you had mentioned the Jersey cow 
uh, as producing that. Do you know why that they chose the Jersey cow over Holstein for this? I think it's just a very, very rich, rich flavored milk. What would make it rich? The fat cow, oh, the, the, the grass. And the cream. The cream. Okay. A very high level of cream. So I used to have a Jersey cow and a Holstein cow. <laughs> Anybody, it's a little known fact, but it's now you know. It's, it's well known now. Thank you for letting us. You're welcome, Natasha. I know you're a city girl, so I, I thought that might impress yeah. you. Yes, thank you. So, that's our cheese. Here's a couple of the big, the big uh, elephant in the room when it comes to cheese is that not all cheese are suitable for vegetarians. So, when you're making cheese, you need rennet. And rennet can be synthetic, or it can be vegetarian, vegetable, I should say, or it can be from an animal. And when it comes from an animal, it comes from the third stomach of an unweaned calf. So, uh, the what do you animal. Think about that, Natasha? <laughs> the animal is not alive when they get that rennet. So, a lot of the older, more traditional cheeses will continue to use that because they say that it, it really makes a difference in the flavor. I don't agree with it, to be honest with you, but I don't think it's necessary in this day and age. But it's important when you're putting a cheese board together, you need to either take into consideration how many people are coming that are vegetarian. If nobody is, then it doesn't matter. If they are, then you need to make sure that you label the cheese so that they know that, because the last thing you want is them to eat a cheese they haven't had before, so that's a wonderful cheese. Go home and Google it and find out that you just gave them something that they just really didn't want to eat. How do you know? Uh, it's, it's on the websites of a lot of these cheeses. Okay. For example, this guy and this guy would not be for vegetarians. Okay. These both use animal rennet. So, and if customer, your, your guests, my customers, your guests, yeah. if they uh, are lactose intolerant, certain cheeses are good for that and certain are not. So dried older cheeses, the lactose sort of evaporates to a degree. So you can eat those if you are lactose intolerant, but not 100%. So you have some wiggle room there, you can eat those cheeses. When it comes to um, sheep's milk, you can eat almost any cheese because in the making of it, the lactose gets rendered out of the way. Um, when it comes to cow's milk, there's no, there's really no way unless it's an older dried cheese. So again, these are all things that you have to take into consideration when you're choosing the cheese for your cheese, cheese board. Cheese. So the next part of our charcuterie board is meat. Uh, today I've chosen four meats to go. Again, you're looking at your audience, who's coming. Um, some people don't eat pork. Some people don't eat gluten. Some salamis have uh, wheat grist in them to flesh them out. Uh, so today I have chosen a corned beef to be the beef component. Uh, this is a corned beef that we make ourselves out in Coltis Lake. An older Jewish man is my partner, and he's from Brooklyn originally. And he grew up eating corned beef in delis in Brooklyn and Manhattan. And when he got out here 30 years ago, what passed for corned beef was offensive to him. Mm -hmm. So he started making corned beef the way he really it should do. And I would buy him off him for the last 20 years. And then a couple of years ago, I bought the company off him and kept him on to make the corned beef. And we sell it to restaurants and bars around the city. Uh, well, before COVID, we did. <laughs> Not selling a lot of it right now, but we're sort of eating it a lot. Um, this is brisket. We trim the brisket. Uh, we put it into barrels of salt water with 12 different herbs and spices. It sits in the barrel for two weeks, but every second day we have to move the ones at the bottom to the top, so it's kind of a labor of love. At the end of that two-week period, we put them in the oven for four hours, slow roast them, and uh, let it cool, and then we have uh, corned beef. This yeah, so, so is that kind of like Colonel Sanders there with your special combination? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's... Uh, it's yes, it could, you could say it's a little bit like Colonel Sanders. That I'm not going to tell anybody about the special, yeah, <laughs> special secret spices. Thank you. Um, I'm going to need to cut that down because, unlike some of the soft cheeses and that, you can put a chunk out and let people cut them themselves, but you can't put a chunk of meat out and have somebody at a dinner party. And in fact, uh, on the cheese front, the soft ones you'd leave, but the harder ones 
we cut down to size and then put back together in a little cheese mountain or back in the shape it was so that the customer or the guest can just come and take a piece and then because you've seen probably before where somebody's tried to hack into a big chunk of cheese and the knife slips and catches and all of them flies across the floor um, so we try to avoid those situations with the meat of course you're going to have to slice that meat um, and meat is always the best when it's sliced and served but I'm going to guess most of you don't have a slicer in your house. So meat needs to be as thin as it possibly can be. The whole idea is that the, melt, the fat will melt on the back of your tongue, leaving the ribbons of meat in your mouth to savor. Uh, if it's thicker, which is what would happen if we tried to cut a prosciutto or a salami, certain salamis with a knife, then it becomes chewy and it doesn't give you the same mouthfeel that you're looking for. So it's meant to be eaten as thin as it possibly can be. Paper thin, we say, you can see light through it. If you go to the delicatessen, they'll try to give it to you a little thicker because that means they have to sell, you have to buy more. So you always want to say as thin as you possibly can, please. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see light through it. Um, and that is the proper way. You cannot go do that at home. So if you're going to make a charcuterie plate, try to get the meat sliced that day or the day before. So, and then don't let anybody get into the packages because somebody at night after a glass of wine is going to decide that's a great idea. Let's try the meat and make sure it's, I'm not looking at you. Why are you looking let's, at me? Let's, let's try the meat and make sure that it's okay for tomorrow, you know? And uh, though that there's too much there, we should probably lighten the load. So um, definitely want to try and keep it airtight so it doesn't oxidize. So we've got two other meats here that are sliced and we've got two that we're going to slice. Uh, this is called Schinken Speck. Uh, it's Speck for short. It's very popular in northern Italy and in Germany and in Austria. It's uh, one single muscle as opposed to a prosciutto, which is a whole leg. And so as a result, it cures in weeks as opposed to months and years like a leg of prosciutto. And because it does that, it means that the producer is not tying up legs and legs and legs for 18 months or whatever. So they're able to turn the product around faster and get their money coming in, so it means it's less expensive. But it gives up nothing in flavor. Um, and there are some local producers doing a very fine job of this type of meat, this spec. Uh, it's hard to find people locally making uh, prosciutto because they, we really don't have a climate we don't have the skill set, and to invest in hanging a couple of hundred legs in a, in a warehouse rooftop and waiting for a year till they're ready to go or two years ready to go, you've got to have another load coming in six months later and another load coming in six months later. It's like making whiskey. You know, you can't get your money out of whiskey until seven years, but each year you're paying for warehousing and so on. So, um, so can you just imagine those guys? that have 50 year old scotch, mm -hmm. how, much, how long they have to wait? How many years do they have to wait, Natasha? 70? <laughs> no, 50. 50 years. It was a trick question. <laughs> um, wow. So we have, this guy is Piacentino. It's an Italian salami, pork. Um, it's a rougher grind. It's got large chunks of fat. This guy, uh, is the speck that we talked about and this is zigeti which is a Hungarian style salami which large chunks of back fat and lots of smoked paprika which is a staple in Hungarian cooking. So speck already sliced and you can see that this is not doing as well as it should do because it's starting to glisten and shine which is what happens when you slice it. If I had just gotten this meat and started slicing it to put on the board you wouldn't be seeing that kind of a, a shine to it. This is the zagetti. You can see the dark color that comes from the smoked paprika and the large chunks of fat. If I tried to cut that with a knife, it would fall apart. So it's important to have a blade, it's important to have a delicatessen. And Boza is my go-to for all these meats and cheeses. I have a long relationship with those guys. We do a lot of business with them. Do you and Excuse me, uh, Natasha, do you have a relationship with the Boza family? Just a little bit. Well, that was a, that was a full disclosure there. <laughs> no, but that's your uncle, right? Is that your that uncle's side of the family? my great uncle. Your great uncle's. Okay. He started it and he was first hanging salami from his basement. Is that's that right? How it started. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I think he also was the first to bring in Parmesan wheels and Parmesan in rail cars, uh, from what I've heard. Uh, a salami is like a sausage. It's made like a sausage. It's ground up pork, it's put into a casing. The difference is that it's a large diameter and it hangs, and it hangs in a temperature control room so that until the moisture comes out. And they, it's a very easy thing to do. It's also very easy to kill somebody with it, so you have to be, you have to watch it. But when the weight changes, that's how you know the moisture's gone. So you're always looking for that. And when it hits that exact weight, the ratio based on how much was there to start, that's when you know that it's ready to serve. So it's basically like a, uh, an old sausage, to the want of a better word. Uh, would you like to help me and do some cutting? If, uh, if you trust me, I, I, I can. There's, there's the very, very thin cut, or there's the thicker cut. Mm -hmm. Which would you be more comfortable with? Well, I don't know. I brought my own knife here tonight. Oh, you did? Huh. Yeah, no, that's not a knife. That's, uh, that's <laughs> not going to do anything. <laughs> very that's sharp. not going to help us at all. So That's a hacking But if test. you're, you know, if, you, if you're, you okay. no, it's probably going to be this, this one. No, it's very sharp, so be careful. Oh, no, that's a knife. Let me try something here. So you want uh, me to cut one of these? Try to cut that as thin as you can, yeah? Okay. Better watch yourself. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Happy Halloween, everyone. Do you just carry a fake finger around wherever you go? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so... Oh boy, I can't, I can't... It is a very sharp knife. Look at that, you can see right through it. Do you want to try the corned beef? Okay, I should try it. cutting the corned beef, not eating it, but try it. Okay, okay. Well, no, but tell me about this this blue cheese. I know when when my dad would buy blue cheese there, he, you know, the stinkier it was, the better it was. And so every time he cut the cheese, it really smelled. And I just, as a kid, I never never got a taste for that. Well, On to the meat, John. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you you missed the, the joke segment. Yeah. Uh, okay, quite a knife, though. No, but my fingers are going, oh, I think it's probably cutting out too thick. That's a thick cut. That's okay. okay. But look at that. Look that's, we don't want that thin. That, that's one that doesn't go Yeah, Natasha. So that's yeah. supposed to be cut thicker. I'm keeping quiet in the meat section. Okay. Okay, I just hope I don't cut my finger off again, because, ooh, look at that, eh? It is quite a nice, uh, sharp knife. I wonder if this came, knife. wonder if this came from the House of Knives, Andre Ng, parents in grade 11 and 12. I don't know if you have an inventory of the knives, so it might go missing before I get out of here. So. Okay, yeah. No, we got a metal detector. Oh, is that right? Okay, yes. Yeah. So there you okay. go, that's great. That's enough? Yeah, you did a good job. All that's right, great. whoops. Thanks very much. Pretty lame on the sausage there, sorry about that. That's all right. So, maybe you want to try that? Okay, I'll step off camera there. Okay, uh, uh, Natasha, you first? No, no, thank you. Oh. I'm the guest that doesn't eat meat. Oh, sorry to hear that. <laughs> so, that is very good. It's tasty, huh? Very good. There's enough there for everybody to try when we're done. So, we sort of covered the meats. We've covered slicing versus slicing with a knife, getting it done the day before, etc., etc. Uh, there's no rules when it comes to this. So, like, if you like other meats, if you know that nobody coming has a problem with pork, then you don't have to get beef. If you like, you don't have to get corned beef, you can get pozzola if you want to get beef. Chicken liver pate is a great uh, off option for somebody who doesn't eat pork. Um, so, ordinarily, this would go onto the board, but I think we've kind of covered that now. The next thing we're going to talk about is uh, condiments. So we're going to make fig jam. It's as easy as anything. These are dried figs and what we're going to do is we cut them in half just to make sure that they're good inside and then there's a stalk stem that doesn't really break down that well so we'll just start trim that off but you don't want to trim off too much because all the goodness is in there and you don't want to be wasting. Uh, these are not very attractive looking that's because there's no sulfur in them. Sulfur allows them to keep their color and if you look at apricots, you'll see dried apricots have lots of nice bright orange to them. And that's because they're soaked in sulfur. They're not very good for you. So whenever you're buying apricots, you should also look for the apricots that look a bit like this, dried apricots. 
because that means that you're not going to consume a fistful of sulfur, which is uh, never good for you. Uh, so what we do these is we do the whole bag, and we would get them in this pot. There'll be more than that, obviously. We'd add in some vanilla essence. So we'd add in sugar, like so. We'd add water here. You're going to cover the figs, and there'll be a lot more in the pot than this. You're going to cover the figs with water, and then basically. You're going to put that on a stove, bring it to the boil, and then you're going to let it simmer for 30 minutes. And when that's done, let it cool slightly, and then just put it in the blender. Blend it all together, and voila, you got fig jam. No reason to ever buy it. It's that easy to make. Uh, right, so condiments. Uh, often overlooked, often considered irrelevant, but in fact they are a major component because you want to try and mix and match and try different flavors and different taste combinations. Um, and sometimes they can actually steal the show. So uh, we tend to spend a lot of time in finding condiments, finding new olives, making condiments. Um, earlier we were, I showed you guys how to make uh, fig jam and here is the fig jam. When it came out of the pot after uh, being on a low simmer for 30 minutes, we just uh, hit it in the blender on the pulse and then let it cool and here you go. So fig jam, it's uh, cheap as chips, uh, goes very well with any kind of spicy meat and goes well with uh, almost every one of the cheese, in particular brie and in particular something blue. Because the blue has got an acrid, sometimes sharp flavor and you want something sweet like honey or the fig jam to cut, the, cut it. This one here is a favorite, it's uh, Guinness whole grain mustard. Uh, I also own the Irish Heather Gastro Pub in Gastown, and we're known for having the best pint of Guinness in the city. And uh, we do, well, pre COVID, we would do a couple of hundred pints a day. We have uh, the lines for the taps, which is six feet below the, the keg. The keg is six feet below the, the tap, which is a major uh, importance when you're pouring a good pint. And so out of those taps come the Guinness that makes this Guinness whole grain mustard. Um, fun fact, uh, Dijon in France, 80% uh, of the mustard seeds used to make Dijon in France come from Alberta. Um, so we ship them over there, they make mustard out of them and we buy them back in again. So. Uh, the next one is Aberquini olives. These are from Spain. They're tiny, the pit is even smaller and so you get a, quite a nice fleshy, um, meaty olive for something so small, these guys. Uh, these are sun-dried cherries from the Okanagan. Uh, pitted, left out on a tray in the sun. They dry. Uh, they, uh, the flavor really, really compounds. So you end up with uh, this explosion of cherry. Uh, and they keep all year round, so you're not going to get fresh cherries all year round. Uh, but this is a great way to use a local product. Uh, these are called cornichons, and cornichon is a baby uh, pickle, a baby cucumber. Uh, they're very popular in France. Uh, you can find them in other parts of the world, but the French seem to have conquered them. Uh, they are tart and garlicky. Uh, they got great crunch, and they're perfect for any kind of cheese and most meats. Um, and they're not that expensive and they go a long way. Uh, this is a Marcona almond. So they're bigger than, they're called the king of almonds. They're from Spain. They're bigger than other almonds. Uh, they also have a sort of a wetter, creamier center, which um, gives a kind of a marzipan texture or flavor. It's almost like a, um, what's the nut from uh, Hawaii? Macadamia. Macadamia nut. So it's like a, almond version of a macadamia nut because the high fat content. These are cooked in organic olive oil and tossed in organic sea salt. Uh, so they're delicious. They're delicious. And so this is something you can eat. Absolutely. And, and more. This is uh, a Casa Vetrano olive. 
These are the number one snacking olive in Italy. They come from Sicily and they're cured in lye, not in salt water brine like most olives are. And what that means is that they keep their color and they keep a crunchy exterior. They're kind of, they're often called the Kermit the Frog green olive and they have the sort of a crispy bite like a green apple. Um, so there's countless variations of, you can take pears when they're in season, slice them super thin, put them on a baking sheet, put them in the oven. You can do the same with apples and then you get apple crisps and pear crisps that can act as a cracker. Um, there's no end to, there's a thing called mustarda, which is basically an applesauce with a mustard oil through it, but they make it with pears as well as apricots and it's a great foil to work with spicy meats. So there's no end to it and there's really no right one. If you like it, then serve it. You think it works, then who's anyone else to tell you it doesn't? So that would be examples of the kind of combination or combo that you could do because you can pick up now some of this corned beef with some of the Guinness mustard with some of the Comte and you've got a great cracker mouthfeel, mouthfeel. Um, so there's no end to what you can do the combinations and the thing about the charcuterie board is that it is the greatest bang greatest wow for the least amount of effort and the least amount of ability so you don't have to have much ability to put together something that looks fantastic and tastes fantastic um, and then so you're saying that's something I could eat. This is right up your alley. I, think it, I was thinking of you when I said it. Um, and the other thing is uh, basically the next day, the leftovers go into omelets. The meats get chopped up and mixed into pasta with olive oil and, and sea salt, simple stuff. The cheese can go into mac and cheese, the best mac and cheese you ever had. So there's, this is not like other meals that you're preparing for guests to come over. This stuff has legs, and days afterwards you're still working through it. Things like the cornichons, the pickles, they're all cured, so another week or two you can still eat them. So it's kind of like almost the perfect entertainment food, in that almost everybody can do it, almost everybody likes it, and every morsel of it gets used up. Uh, the only last part to add to this are crackers. So the final product. We've diced, we've sliced, we've balled, we've bowled, we've done everything we can to get everything together. Uh, you would be putting this on a large platter or a large bowl. If you get a chance to use any kind of uh, wax proof paper, it's always a nice contrast into, as opposed to the white board or the wooden board. And also if you don't have tags, which I recommend as ways to tell everybody what they have, these are just basically shop tags, they're cheap as chips. You can get them in any store, but if you don't have those, you can actually write on the wax root paper with a Sharpie what the cheeses are and what the different things are. You would suggest a white Sharpie for that, the black uh, paper? Uh, I was thinking of more of the white wax paper with the Sharpie. Oh, yes, I don't, I, they're white good Sharpies. Point. Good point. Yes, they are. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. I've got a bit of background in art. Is that right? A bit of background in everything? Uh, pretty much, pretty much. Excellent. You know, you know when you got 10 years of pre-med, you know, you can cover a lot of <laughs> Uh, so this is one that we have done, and these are the tags, here are the meats, the cheeses, the condiments, and then the crackers. And the crackers are the last part of the equation. Uh, we like to use crackers that are neutral, not uh, spicy, not black peppery, because the cracker is really a vessel to get the food into your mouth without using your fingers. Um, but if it is too flavorsome, it overpowers the very expensive meat or very expensive cheese that you're putting in your mouth. So something like a fine water cracker, not expensive, so you can make these yourself. Or sometimes a digestive, the wheat of that just goes really well with the cheddar. Um, and then also, again, thinking about who's coming, uh, these are gluten-free crackers rice crackers as well. They're always, they last forever, they're always great to have, and they're always great to throw onto a board. And nothing uh, makes people feel more welcome than when they come in and realize that you've actually taken the time to notice, remember, 
uh, things about them and their, their dietary requirements or the likes or dislikes and you've reflected that in a, in a board or a platter that you've done for everybody. Well, so, especially when you're looking out for people, the flaxseed there apparently is very good for the hair and the complexion as well. Yeah. It's just a winner all around, yeah. It's all around. You do know everything. Yeah, I do. It's no, a burden. I'm not. It's a burden. Uh, so that's it, folks. Um, that pretty much sums up Check your board. So, Sean, this to-go box is explain to us. Yeah, so we, we realized with uh, COVID that we were trying to find ways because we are entrepreneurs, so trying to find ways to keep some stream and revenue stream going in, but also we were looking at what can we do now that when COVID is over, we still have sit still has legs, so that we're trying to find things that uh, are sustainable. And so we realized uh, selling charcuterie to people and cheese, and because we spend a lot of time curating, finding this product, um, a lot of it is not available in a lot of the cheese in that are, are not available readily, some are, but you don't have to use all my cheese. But what we did then was that we put together a box, but we couldn't find a box. So then we were looking at a pizza box one day and thought, hey, we could put it in the pizza box. Really? So it's a pizza box without pizza. And it's actually become very popular and um, we charge $45 and it's got four kinds of meat, four kinds of cheese, and it's got uh, crackers and uh, eight condiments and as I said you know the next that's great for a couple bottle of wine the next day you get lunch out of it you get breakfast out of it it's great for four people sitting down and, and having a dinner if of course you always have to be family now sitting around you're not uh, friends not sitting around in COVID but it's uh, you know after COVID we think we found the summertime people are picking out of picnics yeah. they're going to the park uh, and it's it's been a, a great great new item for us so and I'm glad, delighted to have this opportunity to introduce you to you guys. That's a wonderful idea as well for a gift at Christmas time to yes. deliver to a family member. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I'm in favor of that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hopefully that was an entertaining evening for all of you. Uh, I know I sure learned a lot. And uh, hopefully you learned a little bit about, more about cows uh, than you knew before you came in tonight. So I'd like to thank Sean for his expertise and his, and his time here tonight. And uh, Natasha or Vanna here. As you can see, Vanna is hosting the, uh, the boards that can be won. I know, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, beautiful boards. Uh, and, and not only can you cut on them, but you can serve on them as well. And uh, it would be an excellent charcuterie board, an excellent presentation. Because remember, as we learned tonight, presentation is 50% of the battle. The other percent of the battle here is cutting up these, uh, these fine meats and cheeses. So if you don't have your own Swiss Army knife here, you might want to go to the Salt Restaurant. As you can see, you can order here and the, uh, the, uh, the address below here. And for $45, you order it, pick it up, and you send it to people because you probably can't go and visit them at this time. But it would be an excellent gift uh, for those people who can't uh, come there. And as I said, if you don't have the time or a sharp knife like I have here, this might be the easiest way to, to serve this.